Okay. First question is just Phil trolling me. <laughs> what's your opinion on up dog? Well, uh, I don't know what that is, so. You're supposed to say what's up dog. Yes. And that's supposed to be the intro. <laughs> I just know what it is. You're too like... smart. There's a reason he's a world record holder. <laughs> What's up guys, it's Timon here. We made a post on Instagram asking people for questions uh, and today I'm gonna answer them. So someone asked a question in Polish and English. In English they said, Timek, what are your future plans? Timek is an abbreviation of my name. So pretty much what they're asking is, what's my plans for my career? For the next few years, I think I'm gonna be a professional cuber. That's what I'm doing right now and it's going pretty well. We'll see how it goes in the next few years, but I'd expect it to keep going well. How did you get around noticing your bad habits and finally getting over them? Well, depends what the habit is, but let's say you're doing a lot of rotations that are unnecessary. You can do solves, focusing on edge orientation and whatever the habit is, pretty much, and trying to fix that. There's no really good way to teach this because every habit is different, but you just need to try your best and practice a lot. What do you think is the optimal balance between efficiency, TPS, and look ahead? I don't think there is an optimal balance. I think the optimal balance is different for every person. For me, efficiency is a lot more important than TPS because my TPS is not naturally as good, but my efficiency is naturally pretty good. And look ahead is probably the second most important of those three. But for example, for Ruihang and Yihang, the cubers in China, for them, it's clear that TPS is the most useful just because they're naturally really, really good at it. And I'd guess look ahead is also second for them. And then efficiency is last on the list due to TPS balancing it out. Timon has mentioned that he doesn't like a few aspects of WCA competitions and that they can be improved. What changes would he like to see? Firstly, I think it's great that we have something like the WCA because otherwise we wouldn't have pretty much any competition. But there are a few things that would be awesome if they could be improved. One thing is the average of five format. I think for high level competitors, an average of five is very, very random. So especially for big finals like the World Championship, it doesn't really make sense to have an average of five deciding who the world champion is, just because the amount of random chance in that is very, very, very high. So when you have 16 people or 12 people in a final and the format is average of five, it's highly unlikely that the best person will win. So I'd suggest doing either average of 12 or average of 25 for big finals and maybe making it optional for local organizers to have also bigger formats if they want to. Obviously this would require some experimentation with how long this takes, how to handle scrambling and stuff like that, but I think it could be done. Which comp do you think was the most enjoyable? I think for me, my favorite competition was Warm Up Sydney 2019 because that was the first competition where I really got to compete in 3x3 free free against world-class competitors and I did really well too. In the first round, I got first place and uh, I broke the European record. That was pretty crazy. Then in the semi-finals, I didn't do that well, but uh, I still got third in the final. So yeah, it was really, really fun. And you know, just meeting all the top competitors Talking to them is a lot of fun. How do you warm up your hands? Depends how cold my hands are. If I've just woken up and my hands are at a decent temperature but not warm enough to cube, I just solve my cube slowly so that I don't put much strain on my hands and then they'll get warm after a few solves. But if your hands are really cold, like you're in the winter and you just got home from, I don't know, walking somewhere, you can do some exercise, jumping jacks, squats, stuff like that, and that'll get your blood running. So your hands will warm up and then you can do what I presented with a decent temperature. So just do some slow solves and then it'll get better. Do you like pizza? Yes. Burger or pizza? Pizza. How do you get so hot? Well, if you live in Alaska, you're not going to be very hot. So you got to move to like Miami or maybe California, somewhere nice. And then uh, that, that should work. Do you think color neutrality is worth it? I think it depends on the person. Seems that at the highest level, there are more and more people using only white and yellow or dual neutrality. Using only a single cross color would be really difficult at the highest level. But uh, color neutral versus dual neutral as a very, very close battle just because when you're color neutral you can waste a lot of time trying to pick what color you're gonna solve whereas with dual neutrality you only have two choices so usually it's pretty easy to decide and you get more time to plan your solution i want to train like you for a week for a youtube video what's your regimen like it's not very consistent but if i had to set a plan for myself i would do something like this practice my algorithms so usually zbls for two hours then do solves for two hours 
then take a break. Obviously, in those four hours that you're practicing, you should also be taking breaks because, well, it's not healthy to sit for four hours straight. <laughs> then take a long break for like an hour, maybe hour and a half. Then practice algs for an hour and then solve for an hour. So six hours total. At what point did you realize you were world class? If you told your younger self that you would be the fastest person to ever solve a Rubik's Cube, what would your reaction be? Well, I think I realized I was world class at Warm Up Sydney. As I said earlier, that was where I got to compete against the top competitors and I placed first in the, in the first round. Yeah, that was really where I realized that. If I told my younger self that I would be the fastest in the world someday, I wouldn't be particularly surprised because that was my plan all along. That's all I wanted to do. And I knew if I work hard, I would achieve it. So, yeah. Do you think that you're almost at your max potential for 3 by 3 In other words, do you think there's a lot that you could work on when it comes to 3 by 3 I think I still have a lot to work on in terms of TPS and look ahead. My solutions are pretty good, but I think even those could still be improved a lot. Yeah, with time, as I get more comfortable with my solutions, I can get a lot better just by look ahead and TPS. What do you eat to get better at cubing? Pizza. Do you have literally any other hobbies? Any involving physical exercise? Yeah, I mean, I play la racket sports recently, just been playing a lot of tennis. I'm not very good, but it's still a lot of fun. I usually play with my dad and uh, it's great exercise. How did you start improving your pseudo F2L and when did you realize it was worth it? And do you think that is the future of F2L? I was shown pseudo slotting by Jonathan Kwoska in 2018 or maybe late 2017. I think it was like start of 2018. And I remember being really amazed by it and wanting to practice it a lot. So I practiced and practiced and practiced until I got comfortable with it. And then I just started using it in my solves without even realizing it. I think after Worlds in 2019 was when I really went big on pseudo slotting, I guess. And uh, I practiced doing solves just using pseudo slotting. So no, no normal F2L at all. Obviously I wasn't very fast to doing that, but it made me a lot better at pseudo slotting and I mean after like a week of doing that I was very very comfortable with pseudo slotting and from then I just used it so much in myself and yeah it's great but I don't think it'll ever be like the future of F2L or whatever because doing just pseudo slotting is first of all very difficult but also even if you're proficient at it it requires a lot of D moves and that's not very comfortable when doing F2L so it's only really useful for specific cases. If there is one thing that is the worst mistake that many cubers are making what is it? I'd say probably not trying to learn from top cubers solutions. I mean I see a lot of cubers solving F2L pairs as if they're still like a 30, 40 second solver when they're solving in 15 seconds. You know, they're just doing moves and they're not really thinking about how they're solving the pair. If they were to compare the, their solutions to top cubers, they would immediately learn the better solution because it's not like the better solutions are algorithmic and unintuitive. They're very easy to learn. It's just that you have to figure out what they are and start using them in yourselves. Another thing is not learning full OLO. This is very, very common for some reason. It seems very weird to me to use a method and not know all of the algs required to use the method. So I think learning full OL, if you don't know it, uh, will be very, very useful. What would you say was your biggest personal breakthrough in cubing? An aha moment where something clicked for you and your results started improving. I remember somewhere in 2018, I was practicing and I was watching a lot of Max's solves. So I was trying to improve my look ahead and I realized what it feels like to not look at the pair you're solving. And I just started actually feeling what look aheading feels like or look aheading to your next F2L pair. And from then on, I improved a lot very fast. Another thing was when Jonathan Kosko told me to uh, basically slow down my turning for fluidity. Something I never realized would be worth it until he showed me like how it works. But yeah, those two were great. Does it get annoying people asking you for photos and signatures and crowding around you when doing solves? It's annoying when people ask me questions. Just kidding. Thanks for the questions. Some of them were really good and really interesting. See you next time.